I'm going to win 10 grand in one night. I made it, boy. I finally made it. Come on, pay up, pay up, sucker. The thing about a good hustler, he can go in a place and win all the money and leave, and everyone likes him. I came to play pool fast. That's good, Eddie. How much? You name it. Well, here we go. Fast and loose. I got troubles, and I think maybe you've got troubles. Maybe it'd be better if we just leave each other alone. You owe me money! The first time I saw The Hustler, I was just absolutely mesmerized by every moment of it. I had a couple of friends in it, and uh, I was very, very close to that world at the time. Very good shot. Leeson was close to being a real professional. He was a superb pool player. Willie Moscone was the technical advisor of the film The Hustler. Paul Newman told me that he had never held a pool cue before Willie started teaching him. I broke my thumb. Oh, God! Oh. I broke my thumb. I realize it's a very tragic love story that happens to be about pool players, but of course the pool world thinks it's a story about pool. Shoot pool fast, Eddie. I'm shooting pool fast. When I miss, you can shoot. You break. This picture was made in 60. It was released in 61. So it still existed within the context, in a general way, of the rotten 50s. The 50s were a time of massive hypocrisy. Following the witch hunts of the McCarthy era, many writers chose subject matter that addressed social issues head on. I think The Hustler is frankish about some kinds of personal issues, you know, alcoholism or maybe even suicide. That was a characteristic of directors and writers like Bob Ross. And these were people who were serious about the movies and felt, I think, that, you know, at the beginnings of their career, that movies had evaded significant issues, personal issues, political issues, social issues, and that sort of thing. And I think it was part of Bob's drive to encompass things that had been eluded, passed over by filmmakers before him in the late 40s and the early 50s, where you know, a lot of subjects, you know, whether it was uh, discrimination or anti-Semitism, those kinds of topics, you know, began to appear in movies. And I think Bob was terribly taken with those possibilities. He came to Warner's. Melvin Leroy had hired him off of a play that he had done called The Body Beautiful in New York. And he came out and he would have had one of those seven-year contracts. He became very well known as a, as a screenwriter. Robert Rawson went on to become writer, producer, and director of many films, including All the King's Men in 1949, which won three Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Island in the Sun in 1957 for 20th Century Fox, and the critically acclaimed They Came to Cordura in 1959 with an all-star cast that included Gary Cooper and Rita Hayworth. In 1960, he would co-write a screenplay about a popular sport in America. The script was based on a novel by Walter Temis. The origin of the game goes back, uh, first recorded in 1090. The game was played outdoors, a form of lawn bowls or croquet or cricket. The game came indoors prior to 1500s and was played on the floor of the home. But then the very wealthy noblemen, because those were the only ones who really played the game, could not bend. A lot of them were very obese. So they moved the, the table to a game table. And then the game really took off in the 1500s with Louis XIV. The word billiard comes from the French bille. So it really, its modern origins uh, would be French. Rawson begins casting. For the role of Fast Eddie Felsen, he gets advice from world billiards champion Willie Moscone. Willie had originally suggested Frank Sinatra for the part of Fast Eddie Felsen. He was old buddies with Sinatra. He thought he would, you know, be good for the part. He probably would have, but I mean, Newman became Fast Eddie Felsen. That's what you and I shoot a game of straight pools. Hundred dollars? Well, you shoot big time pool fats. I mean, that's what everybody says, you shoot big time pool. Let's make it $200 a game. Paul was on the money. I mean, the way he, he 
walked around the table, the way he chalked the cue, the way he eyed the shots. Five ball. You know, this is my table, man. I own it. Paul is a wonderful all-around actor and athlete. He went in there not knowing almost anything about shooting pool. And Moscone coached him and showed him things for a couple of weeks, and you know, he looked like a really good pool player. That's 10. You punk, you two-bit punk. Come on, pay up 100 bucks. To convey the character traits of the ultimate pool hustler, Jackie Gleason is cast in the role of Minnesota Fats. His repute at that point was based on this somewhat raucous television character that he played. And there's a real delicacy in his playing, you know. You now they say, well, sometimes large men are very graceful, you know, they, they dance well and stuff. And that is the impression he's conveying in this movie. He is great. He's that old fat man. Look at the way he moves like a dancer. I like the nice thing he sort of, he's powdering his hands, you know, he's sort of fastidious about his appearance. And then there's a kind of a nice watchfulness about him. He recognizes this is a very talented guy, the Paul Newman character. How can I lose? And he knows that he is going to be his great rival. The way he looks at him, the way he studies him, the way he, in a sense, conveys appreciation without exactly conveying it, without, you know, showing because if he did, it would be a sign of weakness on his part. Uh, that's all very nicely done. Yeah, big creep broke my thumbs. Man named Turk Baker? You know everybody, don't you? Everybody who hurt me, everybody who helped me, paid. The more sinister side of hustling is depicted by Burt Gordon, as played by New York stage actor George C. Scott. He carried a certain kind of a weight, a certain kind of presence, an intensity about him. It didn't happen in Louisville, it happened someplace else. It didn't happen now, it happened six months from now. It's kind of a danger. That's interesting in the way he plays it. There's a, it's something I always remembered about that performance, that stiff-necked quality, you know, that very slow turning and observation. He doesn't actually, until the end of the movie, have an awful lot of dialogue in this picture. It's just a presence, and it's a presence of he's going to get this guy somehow, he's going to get him under his wing, and he's going to destroy him or attempt to destroy him. This is a terrific performance by Scott. You're going to get your thumbs broken again. And your fingers. If I want them to, they're going to break your right arm in three or four places. Adding love and meaning to Fast Eddie's life is Sarah Parker, who has demons of her own. She is played by actress Piper Laurie. Piper Laurie very much kept to herself. I thought Rawson was very smart in casting her because it brought a kind of an odd quality, you know, sort of an off-center off-kilter feel to the character uh, instead of the standard engineer. I know where you live. In a locker and a bus station. We shot all of the interior scenes, all the scenes between Newman and Piper Laurie that happened in the apartment. The set was built. On, it was a Fox studio, I believe, on 55th Street and 10th Avenue. The dressing rooms were like um, fairly small, they were almost like cells, really, where all, there was an old building, and they were like, um, I would say the size of them were maybe 10, 12 feet by 8 feet or something, and basically sort of brick and, 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 and uh, you, I don't remember a window, to be honest with you, I could be wrong. Um, she went on to furnish that dressing room as if she was going to live in it for the rest of her life. I mean, she had it fully furnished with pictures, and I think she would stay over. My impression is she would actually sleep there. It's a great feeling, boy. It's a real great feeling. Make shots that nobody's ever made before. And you play that game the way nobody's ever played it before. You're not a loser, Eddie. You're a winner. Some men never get to feel that way about anything. To me, this movie is alive in the pool rooms. And, and to a degree, in everything that directly leads up to the pool playing, I think that's what most of the audience remembers is most of it. And it's what works best in the movie. We had a technical advisor called Willie Moscone, who was, at that time, I think, world champion. Every pool player was on the set or 
came to visit was clearly in awe of him. He was a very dapper man. He reminded me of Gleason, oddly enough, because he dressed, you know, always was a tie and a suit. Very, very neat and quiet man and absolutely brilliant on a pool table. It was like watching a great musician, you know, a great violinist or a great cellist or, I mean, there was nothing he could not do once he, he, he went to work on that pool table. I mean, he was obviously enormously helpful to uh, Paul Newman and to Rawson. Paul Newman told me when I interviewed him for the book that he had never held a pool cue before Willie started teaching him. And Willie taught him not only how to hold the cue, but how to look like a pool player, how to look like a hustler. And Paul, he used to practice at a girl's high school. And he used to come on a motorcycle in disguise so he wouldn't be mobbed. And he'd go down there and he'd practice for hours and hours. Uh, and he learned to play. But the really great shots that you see on there, you'd go from Newman's eyes to Willie's hands. And he made the shot. He was a technical advisor, but he's also in the movie. He was always the one that they were giving the money to to hold the stakes. You know, it was Moscone. Willie, give him the stake. You got yourself a pool player. Preacher, give me my coat, will you? We're shooting in a location that was absolutely wonderful for that. It was a real pool room called the Ames Pool Room in New York. It was off Times Square. And when you walked in, the feel of it, the filtered light through the windows, the pool tables, it was not a set. It was the real thing, and you just you just knew it. It was shot by uh, Eugene Shufton, the uh, creator of the Shufton process, which was a different way of do, uh, doing matte photography um, that involved literally mirrors. You know that old phrase, they do it all with mirrors out there. Well, the Shufton process actually did do it with mirrors. It, it was a way of projecting a background by the use of mirrors. And... Um, so Shufton was a, a legendary cinematographer, and I think his lighting in the, in the pool scenes is just fabulous. And I think that's a very, very significant part of this, the success of the movie. See, that reality, the reality of Newman's playing, the reality of Gleason's playing, the reality of George Scott's playing in the pool rooms, and then you know, sort of capped by the reality of the setting, the reality of the light. It's what's most original about the movie and most authentic about the movie. Since The Hustler was released in 1961, many people who play pool professionally, and even those who play socially, believed Minnesota Fats and Fast Eddie Felsen were based on real people. When Walter Tevis was inducted into the BCA, the Billiard Congress of America's Hall of Fame, he made a statement at the dinner that the two characters in the movie, Minnesota Fats and Fast Eddie, were totally fictitious characters. Now, since then, everyone knows Minnesota Fats, a.k.a. Rudolph Walter Wanderone Jr. After the movie, Fatty legitimately changed his name from Wanderone to Minnesota Fats, had a Social Security card, Minnesota Fats. When we paid him his, his fees for appearing on TV for the shows that I did, he was paid under the name Minnesota Fats. Fast Eddie, another fellow by the name of Ronnie Allen, who's a great pool player, great hustler, a great tournament player, said, this is me. And again, when Walter said, these are, it is totally fiction, they are made up, it is not based on anyone, you have to believe him. The characters of Minnesota Fats, Fast Eddie Felsen, and Burt Gordon were fictional people. However, hustling at pool was real. I would say the hustle started on day one when two fellows entered a room and one thought one was better than the other and figured out, figured out some kind of, uh, I don't say a scam, but figured out that he had a, uh, a better game than his opponent. And I, I think really the hustle came in more to match play. When two fellows came into the room, they made odds. Either they spotted each other money or spotted each other points. The late 19th century into the 20th century, you had professional pool hustlers. And, and, and right on through the 20th century, it didn't, it didn't end there. You had guys with very colorful names who would travel the country hustling pool. And of course, what hustling was is uh, you go in, you uh, play for money, don't play your best, and then when the stakes go up, you cash in. You had people who just played the whole country that way. After a while, they would be known in their own venue. Word would spread after a while 
you wouldn't be able to go into a pool room and play anybody anymore, so you have to move on. And there were guys, actually, who traveled, you know, across the country doing that until they were discovered. Pool house has been around many years, but when it really got big was during the war. Uh, you know, during the war when a lot of the people went overseas to fight and, a lot of, and during the Depression to also, you know, uh, I know players that were playing for big money back even during the, the uh, Depression. It was a Depression-type game, you know. Uh, I mean, there were people that they had no place to go. Pool room was heated. It was warm. You'd go in. For a small change, you were able to rent time on a table, and you could play pool. And because nobody had much money, you would try, you know, try to take the half a buck or dollar that this guy had. And uh, it, it was a game that thrived in, in that kind of atmosphere. I would say that the, the one person who gained the most from the movie, other than the industry itself, had to be Fats. When we did the uh, series called the Legendary Pool Players Tournaments, the Great Pool Shootout was the first one in 1978. Here's Minnesota Fats, who played in very few tournaments, never won one, did not finish higher than third in any tournament, changed his name, exploited the name, exploited the movie, made more money than any living human, like he would say, from the movie, on the left side, and the greatest pool player in the world of all times, on the right side. Willie became the greatest by pure ability. His longevity as king was 17 years. He set a record and break a record, almost in the same tournament. He played match games, just like Fats and Fast Eddie played, but challenge matches for his title. And then here's Fatty on the other side, who knew exactly what buttons to push. He would aggravate Willie to death. And Fats was a showman. Fats was funny. I mean, he would tell Willie things, and Willie would go off like a Roman candle. And he'd just go on and on and on and tell stories. He was like W.C. Fields' character. He was going to have this eating contest with this, this man in Illinois or somewhere. And he was sitting in the room waiting for, for them to bring this person that he was going to go up against. And uh, they, they bet maybe five ten thousand dollars supposedly you know so fats is sitting in this room they got all this food and this is the food they're going to use for the contest right so he waits and he gets impatient so he finally goes over and eats a couple of turkey legs he says you know so finally he sees down the hall they're bringing this man and he weighs about 800 pounds and it one a person on each side bringing this man to the to the you know into the room they get to the door and they, the guy's so big he couldn't get through the door so Fats said he just went over and he ate a couple more of those turkey legs, you know, and just greased the door down really good, or hams, you know, and greased the door again. They just slid the guy on in, and he, then he ate, knocked out a couple more turkeys and everything else and beat the guy for the money. But, I mean, that was, his stories were like that. They were out, outrageous. I got to play Fats on the Dick Cavett show. I was doing Promises, Promises, the Broadway musical, and uh, they called me at the last minute and they said... Uh, Peter Falk was supposed to shoot a game with Fats on the cabbage show, and Peter had the flu. Could I come over? So I go over. And uh, he played eight ball. He said, what do you want to play, eight ball, kid? And I said, okay. So I broke, he missed, and I ran the table. Now, he said, oh, you've been spending more time in the pool room than the acting class. So he did a couple of trick shots, and Cabot asked me to do a trick shot, and I set up this shot that was Moscone's finale to his act, which was one in the corner, two goes cross side, and the cue ball goes three rails and makes the three. And I nailed it the first time. So now I come back to the theater, and this little stagehand says, uh, so how did it go? And I tell him the story, how I beat Fats and then made this incredible trick shot, one, sh one take. So the next day he comes in and says, I made $600 on you last night. I said, what? He said he went to this bar, and on comes the Cabot show on a tape delay. And he's sitting with all the other guys, the stagehands. He says, I bet Jerry beats Fats. <laughs> and he says, I bet he makes that trick shot the first try. <laughs> so he said he, he passed posted me like they used to do with races, like in the sting. The film premiered in Washington, D.C. in September of 1961, even as questions arose concerning its subject matter. Arriving in Washington, D.C. for the premiere of his latest picture, The Hustler. Producer-director Robert Rawson is accompanied by Piper Laurie and George C. Scott two of the stars of the sensational expose of pool rooms and the racketeers who operate them. It's the national capital's most exciting 1961 turnout of notables. 
and the trio joined by Willie Moscone, international billiard champion, and Orville Crouch, form a reception committee to welcome the distinguished first-nighters. Senator Henry Jackson of Washington State and Mrs. Estes Kefauver, whose husband is anathema to gangsters and racketeers, are here. Associate Supreme Court Justice and Mrs. Tom Clark are also in attendance to see The Hustler with its vivid exposure of the crimes now under federal investigation. Here, too, are Senator and Mrs. John McClellan of Arkansas. 20th was very worried because uh, he hadn't done well on the film before and they didn't understand the pool aspect of it. They were terrified that women would not understand pool and they wanted him to cut the whole opening segment uh, before the picture was released. And furthermore, they were trying to support a picture that was in production in Rome called Cleopatra, which was draining the studio. Richard Burton, whom Bob Ross and Newman, who he directed him and Alexander the Great, had somehow got to see this movie. I guess Bob had invited him to it. And he loved it so much that he arranged a late night screening after the Broadway theaters had, had, you know, everybody had done their jobs in the theater. So at 11 o'clock at night, we all went to this screening at Fox and, and Burton hosted it. You know, he got up and said that he'd seen the movie and thought it was a marvelous movie and wanted everybody to see it. I know at the time that people were really concerned about The Hustler, the people who had made The Hustler, because the studio was really dumping it out there. It went wide with it. It didn't count on, I think, the very good reviews the picture got. It was actually a movie that uh, we would now say needed to be platformed. It needed to let those reviews sink in and let people come to see it, find the movie and, and find its, its ultimate audience. Building on its critical acclaim, the film goes on to be nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Actor, Screenplay, Director, and Best Picture. It's a movie that kind of became a legend, you know, in the sense that it disappeared I know it was a, a bitter blow. You know, the tragedy of Bob Rossum was he died very young. He had at least another good decade of filmmaking in him, and it's one of those tragedies, because he was a very serious filmmaker. Fat man, shoot a great game of pool. So do you, Fast Eddie. <laughs> 